Welcome back, everyone. This is Politics Tonight, and we're still discussing Nigeria's economic outlook and investors' confidence. And I've been speaking with Kelvin Emmanuel, an economist. Mr. Emmanuel, let's uh, move on with this conversation. And, I mean, when we say government, obviously we're not uh, only referring to the federal, but also state government. What is the role of the state governors in the revival of this country's economy? That is a very important question because subnationals are very, very key. Um, the subnationals, we look at Nigeria debt stock, subnationals are between 14 and 15 percent of the total debt stock. And the fact that nursing rate is what it is has affected, is, is led to serious revaluation losses for the state governments. Um, I, I honestly think that there are very critical reforms that need to be made. For example, I'm encouraged by the fact that the president has called the governors to the FEC. And he's mentioned to them about um, state police, which has been a subject of hot debate for a very long time. If we're going to address the issue of national security, we have to realize that a federal policing or central policing system just doesn't work. And that's the reality of it. We can decide to go around the topic and dance around the topic and massage the topic. But the reality is that the federal policing or central policing system is not working. So the president proposing state policing system works. But the president, in order to you know, ensure that there's checks and balance and doesn't lead to abuse by state governors, needs to work on ensuring that the reforms his predecessors are made for the fit alteration to the 1999 constitution where the National Assembly said, listen, mm. um, we give financial autonomy to the judiciary, state judiciary, and the state house of assembly is done. And that um, these governors also do not have control over um, the funds that are designated for the local governments. Because what you have today is that the governors practically control the 774 local governments in Nigeria. You know, and I think Akiti State is the only state that was able to say, look, you know what, we're going to, um, when the whole issue of judicial financial autonomy for judiciary came up, Akiti State took the lead in giving full financial autonomy to the state and judiciary. You know, um, you need the Nigerian Governance Forum to come together and be able to address this issue of financial autonomy to local governments, um, as stated in the um, uh, this thing. Because when you look at that Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Location Commission, um, the federating units, um, federal government has 55%, state government has 29%, local government has 16%. For you, for example, to create strong D roads, farm settlement roads that will help um, production, food production, primary food production, you need local governments, not state governments. And for that to happen, local governments have to be financially independent and they have to look, um, elect their chairman. This is very critical and important. Also, the president needs to focus on um, being able to change the principles of derivation. I think this is a very hot button political topic. There are five principles of derivation that um, you know, ensures that, 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 that sets the tone for how um, monies are shared according to the federating units, uh, um, land mass, equity of state population, um, you have um, IGR and then you have derivation. Mm -hmm. So I, I like this example because it explains this issue. Lagos State has the smallest land mass in Nigeria, 3,527 um, 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 square meters. But has, is, the IGR Lagos generates alone um, is equivalent to 26 states in Nigeria. So how do you set population, um, sorry, land mass, um, as a metric for dividing revenues along federating units. You need to let the states to generate their revenues. You need to amend the exclusive legislative list. The 68 items that make makes up legislative list, the uh, exclusive concurrent and, um, and uh, residual list, and give more autonomy to, to the states to be able to be um, financially independent, rely less on loans, rely less on federal government intervention, and take control of their lives, basically, and answer their fact. That is what the president needs to do to make the state government. There are structural reforms that are not easy to do because it's easy mm -hmm. to say, but they are not easy to do because it needs the support of the National Assembly. And you, you basically have a National Assembly that is polarized, even if the ruling party has majority in the NAS. Um, um, he's going to need to work to lobby the National Assembly to ensure that they go along with the reforms. You know, and, But without these structural reforms, it's going to be difficult for him to really get the state governors to act. All because right. just telling them that this is what he wants is not going to work without creating the legal backing and framework for them to work. All right, so I get that. But one major concern has been the fact that uh, state governors have 
I mean, for some months now, have had increased FAC allocation. But some of them do have nothing to show for it in alleviating this hardship on their citizens. How do we continue to hold them accountable? Well, so, yeah, they've had increasing FAC allocation from the removal of petrol subsidy. And, um, yes, they, they've not shown it. A, a lot of states have not shown anything for, for, for it so far. But then again, it comes back to financial autonomy. There are two major arms of government um, that will hold the governors accountable, and that's the judiciary, state judiciary, and um, this, especially the state house facility. Mm -hmm. Without financial autonomy for these two major arms of government at state levels, you're, you're just not going to have anything. Because what you have today is that the state, state governors are lords. They control the show. So for, for, the, for the president to be able to ensure that he has... House of Assemblies and state judiciaries that, that are able to hold governors to account it needs to give financial autonomy to them. So everything the president can do to ensure that they have their financial independence, he has to do. That's the way to checkmate them. All right. I hear that. But earlier in the year, uh, President Tinubu said roadblocks to economic growth have been removed with a pledge to maintain the momentum. I mean, part of these are multiple taxations and levies, as well as customs duties uh, that are imposed on businesses. Private business and entrepreneurs like yourself should be smiling at this point, don't you think? Well, um, so far, the president has not implemented the um, recommendations of the Presidential Committee on Fiscal Reforms to mm. reduce the number of um, taxes to 10, harmonize it, harmonize the tax code. That will need... Um, um, National Assembly to to work because the um, Federal Land Revenue Service works on an act um, that was passed at National Assembly. So for it, for them to work on the tax code, he needs to uh, communicate his vision to National Assembly and he needs to lobby them to to ensure that they can harmonize the tax code. It's very very critical. Also, I I honestly believe, and I've said this severally, that I don't believe the Nigerian Customs Service should be in charge of collecting revenues for the for, for the Nigerian government. It should be Who should be in charge of it? To be the exclusive preserve of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Okay. Um, the customs is for trade facilitation, and the customs should move from Federal Ministry of Finance to Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade, and Investment because they're supposed to be for trade facilitation. You know, I, I don't think that um, the current system of revenue collection works very well. And in terms of taxes and levies, especially illegal taxes and levies, it, un unless the president can harmonize the tax code and change. Um, fundamental areas that governs um, tax collection and system and bring the informal economy into the formal economy. It's going to be very difficult for you to have us improve in that ease of doing business metric in Nigeria that will encourage inv investors and companies to put more money on the ground. All right, we'll come to that if time permits us. Uh, let's go back to CBN. There was a circular, uh, the circular that was issued by the CBN in January to banks addressing suspected cases of excessive foreign currency speculation and hoarding. There were this requirement as well. Uh, have banks, do you think banks have adhered to those requirements? And two, how has that influenced the look of things? If it asks, to what degree? Well, so the secular way, the central bank said that in terms of net open positions long, um, banks are obligated to keep 0% net open positions long and 20% net positions short. Um, I, I don't think the banks have fully implemented it. Um, it boils down to the governor and the deputy governor in charge of financial system stability and the director in charge of the banking supervision to ensure that the banks comply and that the um, banks don't hold, because you have what they call your um, all-in rates, a second check, mm -hmm. which is the difference between um, the rate at which the healers get and the rate at which they quote in the INE market. But you can see that basically the fact that you've had an alignment in terms of the official rate and the parallel market rate, and there was a time like two or three weeks ago when the official rate went above the parallel market rate, it's difficult for banks to be able to make money from that arbitrary trade that they were making, you know, that encouraged them to keep um, over $5 billion onshore um, long for net open positions. You know, and you know, cost speculations in, in the FX markets in Nigeria. But I'll tell you that so far, I'm happy with the pace of changes and reforms. I um, just hope that you know the central bank can keep at the pace and they can enforce the decisions that have been made and the circular that has been sent out. Um, I also think that 
Another thing that the central bank needs to deal with is the revaluation losses and revaluation gains. And um, it, the way it's going to be interesting to see what the books of the central bank will look like when they come out to their annual audit report according to Section 50 of the uh, CBN Act of 2007. Right. So earlier you talked about how you think the president must address the issue of uh, multiple taxation. So I wanted to ask, how important is data accessibility in this? I mean, you and I know that our country, Nigeria, we have a data problem. How important is data in addressing this challenge? So the, this, this comes back to the question um, of, you know, the tax authorities, states, inland revenue service, employing consultants to be able to work with consultants to bring in um, the informal sector of the economy into the formal sector of the economy um, in, in terms of um, partnership between the Federal Inland Revenue Service and the State Inland Revenue Service. So, for example, you can have a situation where um, there's an MOU between FIRS and um, State Inland Revenue Service, and the State Inland Revenue Service that are more on the ground and they understand the system can drive collection of federal taxes and they collect a small percentage of performance. You know, um, again, on the other side of this debate is the fact that, you know, um, some people have said that, um, you know, when the minister of FCT, current minister, was governor of River State, he had sued the federal government, asking for him to be able to collect back on mm -hmm. federal personal income taxes um, at the state level. And, you know, he got if I, an order at the uh, federal high court, I think, you know, a, a state high court in, in, in River State. You know, and the former attorney general challenged that in court. So I think it's important for us to define our tax strategy and make amendments. This is the reason why we need to harmonize our tax code. Um, this is the reason why all those illegal taxes and levies in River State, for example, there are about 96 different taxes and levies that businesses pay. You know, if you're able to harmonize it and bring the informal sector of the economy into the formal sector of the economy, and bring that down to 10, it will help businesses to be able to plan and it will reduce how much of that they price into the cost of their goods and services. Right, so Mr. Kelvin, I want us to go back to some of the president's moves in attracting foreign investors to this country. And I remember that in November, uh, Nigeria and Saudi Arabia agreed to a deal to revive the country's non-functional uh, refineries with a revamp to be completed within or two or three year time frame. I want you to speak to the economic impact of, of this deal. I, 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 I am not in support of um, government owned refineries because I don't think government. Um, You're not in support of it? I'm not in support of it. I don't think God, the government can manage um, business. I, I am of the opinion that the government needs to get away from the business of refining crude oil. Um, you know, the last of 210,000 barrels. Combined capacity in Port Harcourt, for example, Port Harcourt refinery was completed in 1989 by British Petroleum and Shell. You know, I, I don't think the government needs to be in that business. I think the government should focus on regulation and have, um, for example, um, NMPC transferred to an asset manager. I, I, I think NMPC should be supervised by an asset manager, which is the Ministry of Finance Incorporated. Mm. Uh, and for example, the government set up the Ministry of Petroleum Incorporated. I think they do the same thing. I think an asset manager will be better at being able to maximize shareholder value with the Nigerian government federating um, units being major shareholders in NNPC, for example, which is your cash cow. I think NNPC as a company needs to become a, a private business, fully private business outside of the control of the government and um, with the control of the major shareholder, which will be the asset manager representing the federal government of Nigeria as an investor in the company. And the government needs to, for example, focus on um, NMPC, for example, sorry, needs to focus on raising capital from the capital markets, um, investing in um, upstream and midstream projects like um, increasing number of oil rigs, um, mm -hmm. building, I'm sorry, um, exploring non-associated gas. You know, the president recently came up with um, an executive order on granting fiscal incentives um, to companies who want to invest in um, um, non-associated gas NAG. In the gas field because most of the gas you have today and uh, we do about 5.6 billion standard cubic feet on a daily basis and most of that gas is from associated gas that are trapped when crude oil comes out of the wellhead you know um, both onshore and mid waters and offshore the the president needs to focus on you know turning nmpc into a cash cow and look at the example of aramco and the only way he can do that if mm. is if he 
allows the, an asset manager to manage the federal government shares um, in a NNPC and invest in strategic areas upstream and midstream to be able to maximize value. I, I don't think the play for you know um, having the refineries work and will reduce significantly the price of petrol because at the end of the day, if that is the objective, the government is going to end up having a refinery where it's still paying a subsidy or whatever comes out because you being able to manage a refinery does not mean that your um, real cost of production is going to come significantly lower than what you have in a deregulated market. Uh, all right, so if I get you clearly, are you saying privatization is the way to go here? Those refineries are very old, and so you need experts, for example, to come in to assess um, the um, technical capability ratio of um, those refineries, Takot, Bore, and Kaduna refineries. Kaduna, for example, is not viable because of the cost of transportation of crude oil to Kaduna. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're stuck with um, Botakot and Wari, for example. Um, for me, I would tell the government that maybe you can strip it down and sell it off um, to investors who want to you know, put money down into it. The, the work here is for you to work on being able to provide the refineries in Nigeria with crude oil feedstock. That's the work. Okay. So if at the end of the day, um, you have a fully deregulated market, are you able to say, okay, we are applying a subsidy on verifiable consumption levels. So for, for example, I'll tell you my, my number on how much of petrol Nigeria consumes every day is not more than 35 million liters per day. You know, I'm happy that when the president came last year, we were able to get that number from what his predecessor had at 66 million down to about 41 million liters per day. But I think he still needs to reduce it by another 11 million liters um, by you know working on verifying not just um, you know supply to the poor, but also um, the demand numbers, you know, confirming demand and ensuring that there's no smuggling of petrol across borders in Nigeria for yeah. arbitrage opportunities. So, so for me, the play is not to, for the government to own refineries and end up subsidizing it, okay. you know, and run it inefficiently. The, the game is to be able to get enough substantial crude oil feedstock and not have a commercial refinery in Nigeria importing crude oil feedstock. Right, because you're talking about uh, refineries, uh, the president also welcomed new trade agreements with Germany, including a deal that calls for the West African nation to export liquid natural gas, an under one deal. Uh, and that's Re Riverside LNG of Nigeria will supply 850,000 tons of liquefied natural gas to Germany each year. And according to that deal, uh, the first delivery of gas is expected in 2026. From your own perspective, what's the significance of this? I think it's significant. Uh, and I think the LNG presents a huge, huge opportunity for Nigeria. I think Transocean opened an FID for about 3 million uh, metric tons in two years ago in 2022. I don't know how far that is going today. Uh, Gola LNG, you know, they have a JV with an NPC and they opened something um, for an FID, final investment decision for 7 million metric tons today. I think they already committed capital to building 30 floating LNG vessels that will deliver sometime late 2026, early 2027, and that can do up to 7 million metric tons of LNG and increase our output. So for example, even if train seven comes for, in for an inland train, um, the question um, a Nigerian LNG is going to ask you is, where are you going to get the gas feedstock to provide train 7? Because train 7 is supposed to add about 8 million metric tons to the current 22 million metric tons. But today, as we speak, LNG currently has 70% capacity utilization, you know, in terms of how much feedstock it gets to be able to produce gas. And I don't think NNPC is out of force major, which it has been in since 2022. So, for example, in 20. 24, when they release their financial number, I don't expect the NMPC, sorry, NLNG will do more than $1 billion in terms of dividends. You know, talk more of um, capital uh, corporate income taxes and withholding taxes that they also pay to federal and revenue service. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for LNG for Nigeria because, you know, Germany, for example, is increasing its um, capacity, infrastructure capacity for what they call floating storage regasification units. They're basically like units that accept LNG as gas, are able to store it, um, you know, close to, um, um, you know, pots, and then store it for a long time, and then when they need it, they regasify it into natural gas, and then they use. You know, so they are signing deals. They signed a deal with um, uh, Qatar mm -hmm. Gas, you know, and um, 